Hi everyone, my name is Tim Roberts and I'm a homeopath and welcome to week one of our four week course on a homeopathic first aid um, throughout the next four weeks. Um, this is what uh, our aims and objectives will be. Um, first of all, uh, be aware of choices in treating common everyday ailments naturally. Uh, the next one is be aware of differences between uh, allopathy and homeopathy. Allo allopathy being uh, conventional medication that you might get from a pharmacist or prescribed to you by a doctor. Um, have a deeper understanding or develop a deeper understanding of health and disease from a holistic point of view. Understand the process of a healthy acute illness and natural body defences. Know when to intervene with nothing, homeopathy or other modalities. Understand the basic principles of homeopathy and their application in first aid situations or acute illnesses. A big one here. Uh, know the difference between acute and chronic illness. Know what can and can't be treated safely at home. Be able to identify signs and symptoms needed to find a remedy. Have an outline of 16 remedy pictures. Have practiced how to use books and resources to help find the remedy. Have guidelines to taking the remedy. And be aware of having a choice in taking control of one's own health and therefore making a positive change in your life. Okay, so from the very outset, I um, need to understand that uh, I am a homeopath. Uh, I'm fully registered by the Australian Register of Homeopaths, and I'm a member of the Australian Homeopathic Association. But I am not a doctor, so I'm not here to give you medical advice. Um, I'm just here to simply pass on some information on homeopathy. Uh, at all times, please consult um, a licensed medical practitioner if you have any queries or any worries always seek medical advice in case of emergencies okay and if uh, if you have any um, doubt or you don't understand uh, anything that we're going to be talking about here tonight <coughs> excuse me um, just drop me a line uh, at the uh, at the end of um, this seminar today, I'll be uh, sharing my contact details with you. Um, but uh, in the meantime, here is my email address. Okay, there it is. Info at organon.net.au uh, So uh, you can always just drop me an email there. Uh, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, so week one. All right, so this is what we're going to be covering today. Okay, so the welcome. Uh, the next thing is history of homeopathy and law of similars, principles of homeopathy, differences between allopathy and homeopathy. And we're going to be looking at four remedies in particular, Arnica, Aconite, Belladonna, and Chamomilla. And um, I'm going to give you some cases to look at over the next week or so, and for you guys to do some basic homework. All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Tim Roberts, again. Uh, and um, as I said before, I am a licensed homeopath. Uh, I'm fully registered with the Australian Registry of Homeopaths. Um, my journey to become a homeopath uh, took me uh, probably around 10 years. It was 10 years of part-time study. Um, uh, I first discovered or found out about homeopathy uh, when a family member of mine had a chronic illness that uh, just wasn't really getting any better with conventional medication. And a friend of mine suggested that I go and try homeopathy. Now, at the time, I really didn't have any idea what it was. I thought it was some sort of voodoo or some sort of uh, 
you know, new age type medicine that I really um, had no interest in doing. But at the time, um, we were quite desperate to help this family member. So uh, I took her along to see this homeopath. Um, and after about a month of, of treatment, um, she started to get significantly better. And I was extremely intrigued. Um, I didn't understand how it worked. It just didn't make any sense to me at all. Um, however, being a school teacher at the time, in particular a science teacher, I knew the importance of having an open mind. I knew the importance of um, trying to self-discover new ways of uh, looking at things. So I started reading everything I could about homeopathy at the time. It was really sort of quite basic stuff. Um, but the more I read, the more intrigued I became. And it was really like a, a drive for me to start studying. And that's basically what I did. Um, and it took me 10 years to finish. Um, there were times when I thought I just wouldn't get to the end. Uh, there were times when I thought I'd give up. But um, my desire to become a homeopath was always there. And um, when I made it, it was a great day. Um, so now I practice uh, on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, I have two clinics, one in Noosa and one on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and I see and speak to people all around the country, uh, either on the telephone or on Skype. So, um, you know, I'm always available to help anybody who would like some help or assistance in homeopathy. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this today. Um, so let's move on to the history of homeopathy. In particular, two points, um, we'll call them the law of similars and the law of contraries. Now, um, the law of similars is the law that uh, homeopathy follows. All right. Now, the law of similars states that anything capable of producing symptoms of disease in a healthy person can cure those symptoms in a sick person. Now, um, what does that exactly mean? <laughs> um, well, basically, uh, if you were to go swimming in the ocean and you were to get salt water um, in your eyes, uh, up your nose, you know exactly the sort of symptoms that you'd get. You'd get like a burning sensation in your nose, you'd get a runny nose, you get watery eyes, uh, you might be sneezing. Um, so the law of similars states that um, uh, if somebody were to be naturally showing similar symptoms to that, so a burning nose, uh, um, watery eyes, a runny nose, um, a dose or, or a homeopathic dose of salt water could actually help those symptoms. That's basically what it says. All right. Now, the law of contrary states exactly the opposite. So if someone were to come in with those symptoms of a runny nose, a burning nose, or whatever, um, they could take a medication that would dry up that nose. Now, I'm not here to, you know, say which is better. Um, it's really irrelevant really um, but they're just two different ways of looking at illness as I said before uh, homeopathy follows the law of similars okay um, for example and and you know we use this law of similars in everyday treatment of just acute illnesses I mean uh, if somebody is sunburned um, we know that uh, when that person is sunburned um, it's actually more relieved by warm water. And in fact, if you put cold water on sunburn, it actually gets aggravated. Right? That's the law of similars. Um, uh, quite often, you know, if you have a, um, if, you, if you bang your hand, all right, and you get a bruise on your finger, quite often if you um, get an even stronger pain somewhere, like a headache, 
then that bruised finger can actually start to uh, feel a lot better because you have something more or something stronger in your body. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, we're, and we're, we've all experienced these sorts of symptoms in our body, right? And in each case, the cure is similar to that particular ailment, but it's also stronger. And homeopathy follows this law. In homeopathy, the person receives a medicine most similar to the whole state or the whole symptoms. But that medicine needs to be stronger than the actual symptoms. So maybe you guys could think of um, some other ailments or some other um, symptoms that are relieved by uh, similar but stronger actions in the body. I've got another one here. Um, heartache from a split with a boyfriend or a girlfriend is reduced drastically on hearing of a friend's grief over the death of a spouse. Of course it is, when you have something more to worry about or something bigger to be concerned about. That small um, little worry or the other worry that you have tends to dissipate. That's the law of similars. Okay, so um, in your notes there that hopefully you all have and you've downloaded there, um, think of, I've got a couple of examples there of, of the law of similars, but think of what happens to coffee. Right, when you have too much coffee. Just take some time now and just write down what happens if you have too much coffee. Just write it there in your example. It's on uh, page, uh, page 10. Just write down there exactly what happens if you drink too much coffee. Just take a minute. Okay, so let me give you some examples of what happens when you drink too much coffee. Uh, you get restless, you, get, you become wakeful, you might have a tremor in your hands or in your heart, you could start to sweat profusely and possibly get some palpitations. Okay, this is what happens when you drink too much coffee, isn't it? Now, homeopathically, we can use coffee to treat these symptoms, to treat the symptoms of or to treat the symptoms of insomnia, where there is overstimulation of the mind, or nervous agitation, or restlessness, or hypersensitivity to stimuli. This is one of the ways that homeopathic coffee can be can be used to treat symptoms. All right. So again, it says anything capable of producing symptoms of disease in a healthy person can cure those symptoms in a sick person. That's what the law of similar states. Right, what about um, example two there? Arsenicum and food poisoning. Now what I'd like you to do here is just take a minute and think about a movie uh, where you've seen people who have been poisoned by arsenic. And what pictures come to mind? Just write it down, what happens? What have you seen an actor or an actress portraying after they've been after they've been poisoned by arsenic? Just take a minute and write that down. Okay, so the symptoms would be uh, you'd be bedridden, uh, no appetite, pale, wasting away. The person's losing a lot of weight. Yeah, sips of water. Extreme griping abdominal pain, sweating, diarrhea, very fearful. So arsenicum could be indicated, or the homeopathic dose of arsenicum could be indicated in the treatment of things like food poisoning, where there is severe abdominal cramping, possibly vomiting, diarrhea, restlessness, anxiety, great fear of death. 
This is what we use arsenicum for, or one of the areas that we use arsenicum for. Again, following the law of similars, anything capable of producing symptoms of disease in a healthy person can cure those symptoms in a sick person. Now, this was actually, um, these laws were proposed by a German physician back in uh, the early 1800s. And his name is Samuel Hahnemann. Now, Samuel Hahnemann was a licensed medical practitioner. Um, however, after practicing, oh, sorry, well, he was born in 1755, um, in the late 1700s, after practicing as a medical practitioner, he became quite disillusioned with some of the medical practices of the day, and he decided to stop being a medical practitioner. Now, in particular, uh, one of the areas that he became disillusioned with uh, was the crude dosing of mercury to for, in the treatment of illnesses, in particular syphilis, which was one of the... Uh, the illnesses that were rife uh, around Europe at the time. And people would be given raw mercury to treat syphilis. And what he noticed was that um, quite a lot of the times people would come down with mercury poisoning and quite often they would die. And uh, Hahnemann truly believed that... Um, you know, if there's a chance any medicine could actually uh, cause um, somebody to get worse and die, then that medicine should definitely not be used. Um, now, it's interesting to note that some people who had used, who were treated with mercury for syphilis, um, some of them actually got better, and some of them, some of them were cured. Um, but Hahnemann believed that the risk was just too great. So uh, he decided to stop being a doctor um, and start uh, researching new ways to treat the sick. Um, now, Hahnemann was a great reader. Okay, He spoke four languages. Um, he studied, wrote, and worked as a translator. Uh, medical uh, practitioners and medical doctors. Uh, and one of the things that he was doing at the time was he was translating um, a book on modern materia medica or modern med medication into German. And he came upon a particular medication called Peruvian bark. Now, uh, Peruvian bark was a medication that was used to treat malaria and it was very, very successful in treating malaria. In fact, it still is very successful in treating malaria. You might know it better as quinine, which is the main medication that's used to treat malaria today. Um, however, uh, during the translation of the medication, um, there was a reason why, well, there was, there was a reason put forward why this particular product, Peruvian bark, was successful. And as to why it was successful in treating uh, malaria, and the reason was that it was it had very bitter. It was very bitter to taste, and that was the reason put forward as to why it treated as to why it successfully treated malaria. And Hahnemann just didn't believe that. Right, he didn't believe that the reason Peruvian bark successfully treated malaria was that it was bitter. It just, it just didn't ring true for him. So uh, what he did was that he embarked on an experiment and he called it the China Experiment. Now, um, he called it the China Experiment because uh, the bark, uh, another name for bark was, the bark was chinchona. All right. Chinchona was the active ingredient of the Peruvian bark.
<clears throat> and the experiment was that he would take uh, this chinchona and see what happened to him when he took this particular medication. So a healthy person taking this medication. And what he noticed was that when he took the medication, he became very drowsy. He became, he developed uh, palpitations, anxiety. He, it very, he became very trembly. He had no energy. He couldn't put two words together. And what he also noticed is that when he stopped taking the medicine, when he stopped taking the chinchona, those symptoms would gradually go away. And then when he took it again, he noticed that the symptoms would come back. So he then said that chinchona produced symptoms in a healthy person very similar to the symptoms that a sick person with malaria would develop. And thus demonstrating the law of similars that we spoke about before. Again, the law of similar states that anything capable of producing symptoms of disease in a healthy person can cure those symptoms in a sick person. So using this law or using this theory, Hahnemann had discovered a way to heal people. He already knew that uh, Peruvian bark worked to treat malaria, but now he knew why. The reason it was successful was that if a healthy person were to take the medicine, they would produce symptoms very similar to malaria. You stop taking the medicine, the symptoms would go away. You started taking it again, the symptoms would come back. And after that, Hahnemann then started testing other medications. Right. He called them provings. He started proving other substances and noting what symptoms taking these substances would actually create in a healthy person. And he then began developing the theory or the uh, the base the base of homeopathy. All right, he called it similar similibus centura, or that's very bad German, but let likes be cured with likes. And this did become the basic principle of homeopathy. And over the next six years, Hahnemann. Um, conducted provings on himself, his family, his friends, and he studied the symptoms of accidental poisonings that would happen when people were taking medication. And of course, he, uh, after that time, he returned to becoming a medical practitioner, but using homeopathy. And he was very ridiculed uh, by his colleagues However, he started getting results following this law, um, and he got astonishing results. However, of course, there are some medications that um, just didn't lend itself to having proper provings done. Okay, so things like mercury, very, very, very toxic. Um, even today, you know, I see patients who suffer the uh, debilitating symptoms of having mercury poisoning. Very, very toxic. And it just wasn't suitable at the time to undergo approving of, of substances like mercury. Now, Hahnemann knew that mercury was uh, also not only very toxic, but it also had um, great healing properties. So... What he started to do was that he started to dilute the medication. And what he found was that 
if the medicine became too dilute, it started to, um, the symptoms that it would create in the healthy would, would be diminished. However, the more dilute it became, it also stopped developing any, uh, any curing qualities to the sick. So this was a real concern for him because he wanted to be able to use medicines like mercury. He wanted to be able to use medicines like arsenic. He wanted to be able to use medicines like aconite or belladonna. He wanted to be able to use very toxic substances that he knew were toxic to the human being, but also had great healing qualities. He wanted to be able to use these, but yet not cause any harm to people. So what he did is that he came upon a way of producing a medication that would essentially be toxic free, but yet also enhance its healing ability. And what he did was that he came up with what we call succussion or potentization of medication. And this is where people just don't understand the genius of Samuel Hahnemann and the genius of homeopathy. And what he discovered was that if he were to get one drop of, let's say, mercury and put it into 100 drops of water, now obviously that mercury becomes less potent. Because if I were to give you a drop of that medication, you aren't going to get as much mercury. And this was the thing that worried Hahnemann, because he realized that the more he did this, or the more he diluted it, the less, um, the less uh, potent it became, or, the, or the, the less impact it would have in treating the sick. But what he discovered was that if he took that one drop of mercury in the 100 drops of water and he succussed it or he put, he banged it on his hand, or in fact what he did is he banged it on his Bible. He banged it on his Bible 10 times. And what he noticed was that when he did that, by producing the energy, putting the energy into the medication, the medicine would in fact lose, start to lose its toxicity because um, obviously you're diluting it. But by succussing it, you would in fact start to enhance its healing ability. And by doing this, he discovered that the side effects were starting to diminish. But also the medicines became more, more curative it somehow released the energy or strength of the substance. And of course, this caused so much controversy within the medical fraternity at the time. And even now, it still does. People just don't understand or refuse to understand that we don't know everything. Um, and that homeopathy works. Of course, when we think about it, it doesn't make sense that if we dilute something, it'll become stronger. And that's exactly right. But what we're doing is that we are succussing it. We're putting energy into it. And that is the secret behind homeopathy. Now, some of you may have studied or seen pictures of what happens to water when it's in different environments. What happens to the crystals of water? I can't think of the fellow's name, but there's a, 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 a PhD recipient in Japan who has um, shown how water crystals can differ according to the environment that the water is in. And I totally suggest that all of you go and Google um, this. 
Google water crystals uh, Japan and you'll see it you'll 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 see it and it's amazing you'll see how the water crystals can change according to different environments and this is basically what happens with homeopathy the water is going to take on the energy or the frequency of the medicine so at the end of the day even if you find this difficult to grasp or difficult to understand because it goes against everything that you believe that's fine at the end of the day if you want to treat your family homeopathically or if you want to treat yourself homeopathically you really don't need to know the science behind how it works it's really not important all you need to know is does it work no I mean we all use a computer how many people or we all use an iPad or we all use a mobile phone we all use a CD. Now, how does a shiny CD work? How, how do you, how can you put a CD into a CD player and press play and all of a sudden you get music? You know, how does that work? Well, I don't know. How does driving a car work? I mean, do you need to know all the, you know, every little thing about how to, how the engine works and how the brakes work and how the, all, all the electronics work to drive a car? Of course you don't. You just need to learn how to drive a car. All right, so all you need to know is that homeopathy works. You don't need to understand the science of it. However, if you're more interested, of course, you're going to learn a lot more about it. The most important thing is that you understand that homeopathy works. Now, how exactly does it work in the human body? Well, in order to uh, fully understand that, you need to understand that um, homeopaths believe that there is a, a balancing mechanism that keeps us healthy in the body. Right, so, um, and we all know that we, we do have this because if you cut yourself, um, the body will heal. Now the vital force is the mechanism that gives us the energy to heal that particular cut. Uh, and our vital force is, uh, will vary throughout our lives. All right. So if we have a five-year-old, his vital force is going to be a lot stronger than, say, a 95-year-old. that five-year-old will be able to get over things like a cut or a, a cold or a flu a lot better than what, say, a 95-year-old will be able to. The vital force animates the organism. It regulates its function and homeostasis. It regulates its... Uh, it's very dynamic. And it restores equilibrium. Now, let's go to a word there, homeostasis. Now, homeo homeopaths believe that the vital force regulates homeostasis, which is a biological mechanism to maintain balance in the body, to ensure survival of the organism. Right, shivering when cold, perspiring when hot, thirst when we're thirsty are examples of homeostasis. Uh, Homeopaths believe that when the vital force is weak, a person might become susceptible to disease, which expresses itself in signs and symptoms. Now, you might uh, have heard of the word or words similar to vital force, and different um, different medical practices or beliefs could have different words for vital force. You might know it better as, say, chi, or your immune system. The vital force is not visible, but of course it has power. Now, as a homeopath, we um, believe that 
a person or an organism experiences symptoms in three planes, all right? The mental plane, the physical plane, and the emotional plane. But in order to fully treat symptoms or sickness, we need to look at all three because together they reveal the unique way a particular individual is experiencing a particular disease. So we could have two people in a room who have a cold or the flu, but yet they're experiencing those symptoms totally individually, very differently. And as a result, even though they both may have the flu, homeopathically, they are in fact going to get different remedies because their symptoms are different. Because as a homeopath, we will select a particular medicine that has the most similar symptom picture to that particular person according to that law of similars. So this makes homeopathy a very individual modality. So we treat the whole person, not just the disease. All right, so let's move on to, and I, uh, what we call provings. <clears throat> now, I did touch on this um, a little bit earlier with uh, Samuel Hahnemann. Uh, now, approving is um, a method that homeopaths uh, undergo to test particular substances to see if they can be used to treat particular illnesses or symptoms in the sick. It's important to note that um, homeopathy just doesn't treat physical symptoms. It treats mental and emotional as well. And all medication or all substances will create not just physical but also emotional and mental uh, symptoms when we take it. Um, and to undergo a homeopathic proving is a very methodical, long process. It's not just simply one person taking one medicine one time and seeing what happens. It's not that at all. In fact, it takes years and years and years and many, 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 many different people to prove just one medicine. And when we look at the Materia Medica of homeopathy, there's 5,000 odd different medicines that have been proven. And uh, you can uh, imagine the amount of hours and dedication that has gone into proving each one of those medications. But it, the proving is the base of homeopathic medicine. Without approving, we can't be sure what symptoms this particular medicine will treat. Um, and uh, all the information needs to be gathered and collated and put together. But by doing it this way, we can be sure that not only are the homeopathic medicines that we're giving to someone safe, but also has a good chance of curing or treating particular symptoms. And again, when we treat someone homeopathically, a homeopath will always look at the totality of symptoms. So this is the entire person experienced by a person, the mental, the physical, the mental, the physical, and the emotional, so that we can choose the right medicine that will represent that particular disturbance within the person. We treat the whole person, 
not just the disease the person is suffering. Um, uh, item to keep in mind is that uh, to treat someone successfully homeopathically, a good homeopath will always just give you one remedy at one time. All right, so uh, basically, if someone were to come in and see me, they will get one medicine. Um, and it's the homeopath skill and experience that determines what that one medicine will be. And we choose that one medicine because we believe that that one, med that one medicine matches the best out of all the symptoms that that particular person is showing. We have to understand that there is only one vital force in each organism. So therefore, only one medicine should be used. Now this is where the skill and the training of a licensed homeopath comes into play. All right, um, there are homeopathic remedies that you can buy from health food stores and pharmacies that might have five or six or seven or ten or twenty or who knows how many remedies in each medicine. <clears throat> and um, people take them and they wonder why they don't work as well as what they should. It's because that when you take a medicine that has, you know, more than one medicine in there, the vital force is going to start to get confused. And it just, it just won't respond the way it should. Um, now, homeopathy is, is very dynamic. Um, it's very interactive. The important part about going to see a license or a, a, a licensed homeopath is the fact that the homeopath is going to want to find out what is happening in your body. Is going to find out what is happening once the remedy has been administered. Is going to ask you for constant updates. Because with these updates, we can change the medicine slightly. We can change the frequency. We can change the amount of succussions that you're doing before you're taking the medicine. We can change the potency. We can even change the medicine. But these changes will only come about once we know how an individual is responding to a medication. The lazy way is saying, I'm going to give you all these medicines in one, and I'm going to hope that one of them will work. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. So when we treat homeopathically, we use one medicine at a time. The next thing we want to look at is uh, the differences between allopathy and homeopathy. Now, as I've stated before, allopathy uh, is the medication or the way of healing that, say, a medical doctor may adopt or a pharmacist may adopt in looking at illness. Homeopaths believe that the body is always striving to keep healthy and in balance. So when the body is threatened by external forces, such as a, a viral infection, a bacterial infection, a parasitical infection, uh, and so on, the body will respond by producing symptoms such as pain, fever, mucus, a cough, uh, diarrhea, and these all <clears throat> um, work together to help the body maintain that balance and maintain that health. For example, pain is a warning that something is wrong. A fever can inactivate many viruses that attack the body. 
uh, mucus in the respiratory tract surrounds and helps to carry off irritating material. A cough can expel that mucus. And in acute illnesses, homeopaths regard symptoms as healthy reactions of the defense mechanism. And these symptoms need to be supported and not interfered with. So, what we need to do, what a homeopath believes, is that we need to adopt medication that will not suppress those symptoms. Now, <clears throat> I need to say here again that if you're concerned about symptoms, if your little one has a high fever, you need to seek the advice of a licensed medical practitioner. Okay? It's really important that with extreme symptoms that they that you're being taken care of. But all we're simply saying here is that homeopathy believes that these symptoms have been created by the body in order to uh, get balance after um, it has been threatened by an external force. And quite often our body can overdo it, can create a very, very high fever, um, can create an excessive mucus. All right. So these need to be, you need to make sure that uh, you're being taken care of. <clears throat> you need to understand also that disease will, will affect the vital force and the vital force will um, will engage the body to try to heal itself. And homeopathy can provide effective treatment for some of these symptoms. So an allopath Will view these will view these symptoms as manifestations of of the disease. So, for example, the fever is being caused by the virus, is being caused by the bacterial infection. A homeopath believes that the symptoms have been created by the body in order to restore balance after it's being threatened by this external force. So orthodox medicine or allopathy will tend to suppress those symptoms, whereas homeopathy will try to give you a medicine that will match those symptoms. So when somebody comes in to see a homeopath, we, uh, we will treat the patient according to the individual symptoms that he or she is expressing, not by a particular disease name. Just because somebody has the flu doesn't mean that we're going to give them a particular medicine that we think may treat the flu. We actually need to look at what the symptoms are. Allopathy tends to grouped together under a certain diagnosis and then prescribes treatment for that disease. Homeopaths aim to strengthen the body so that it can resist harmful organisms. So holistically, homeopaths view the patient as a whole person of interlinking or interdependent parts. We don't separate mental from physical illness. We believe that all symptoms work together to create a total picture and we treat the whole body. <clears throat> Homeopathically, we uh, 
We know that homeopathic medicines are non-toxic. They're extremely dilute. As I said, we, uh, a good homeopath will only give one at a time. And that they don't cause side effects. Whereas allopathically, quite often medication do have side effects. So advantages of homeopathy is that uh, we see a lot less patients. We spend a lot of time with each individual patient. We get to know the person. And the more we get to know the person, the more able to individualize particular medicine. We need patient involvement and we need the patient to take responsibility for giving accurate descriptions of symptoms. It's much less expensive. Homeopathy will strengthen and heal the mechanism of the body. It brings about harmony within the mind and body. Whereas the mind will gradually start to relax and well-being can be experienced. And in some cases it can work very quickly. However, allopathy also has some advantages over homeopathy and this is important. Allopathy is extremely valuable when the vital force has been significantly weakened. In emergency situations where there is loss of vital fluids, it's way superior for mechanical injuries that require surgery or manipulation. Um, allopathy is uh, way superior when where chemical toxicity has occurred or there's been drug overdoses or accidental poisonings. Again, always seek the advice of a licensed medical practitioner if you're at all concerned about yourself or a family member. Okay, so it's at this point now we start to look at um, particular uh, homeopathic medicines that you may want to uh, use uh, in your family or for yourself. Um, and... Uh, I uh, want to let you know that um, it's possible for you to have um, these medicines in your medicine cabinet or somewhere else at home. Um, and um, I actually sell these medicines. Um, and you can go to my website in the store section. Here is the web address now. And you can go there and you can actually buy a homeopathic first aid kit. Um, now these are, this is a particularly um, beneficial way for you to have these medicines. It's a very economical way for you to have these medicines in your home. Uh, you get all 16 remedies that we'll be speaking about over the next four uh, over the next four weeks or so, plus a whole lot more. And you'll also get uh, a little instruction manual on how you can uh, treat uh, illness homeopathically and what medicines can be used to treat certain afflictions. Um, as well as that, uh, you could, uh, you'll be able to contact me as I'll give you all the details later um, if somebody in your family is ill and I'll be able to say, you know, have Arnica and you can go straight to your kit and get the Arnica and um, away you go. So, uh, Go to this web address, I would totally recommend, and buy one of these first aid kits. It will last you at least 10 years, um, and it's just a great way that you can be sure that you have the right medicine on hand if you need it. So, let's start looking at um, four medicines in particular. All right, The first one is Arnica. Now, Arnica is a herb. You can see a picture of it there on the screen. It has yellow flowers and looks a bit like a marigold. It grows in cooler climates at high altitudes. And the medicine is made from the whole plant, including the root. Now you may have heard of Arnica, because uh, 
It's very, very popular. And it's generally the first medicine to think of after an accident uh, that has caused uh, injury or trauma or where there is shock. For example, a fall, a blow, a bruise, um, after childbirth or surgery, overexertion and sprains, or after an injury with delayed shock. It promotes healing, controls bleeding, reduces swelling and prevents pus forming. Uh, as well as that, emotionally, it can also be used to treat complaints from shock or when someone is denying an illness or is fearful of being touched. People needing Arnica will feel sore and bruised and will not want to be touched or jarred. Uh, when they're lying down, the bed feels too hard and they can't get comfortable, which makes them seem restless. And they may say to you, I'm okay, just leave me alone. For example, after being knocked down by a car, the person may get up, demand to be left alone, maintaining that there is nothing the matter, even though blood is pouring from their head. Uh, it can also be used for um, bleeding gums after dental treatment. It can be used to treat broken bones, uh, where the first stage of fracture, or where there is swelling and bruising, can be used to treat bruises with swelling without discoloration. If given at a time of injury, it will help prevent bruising. Arnica speeds up healing and controls bleeding externally and internally. It can be used for eye injuries, bruising to the eyeball and surrounding areas, head injuries, nosebleeds, joint pain with a particular sore or bruise feeling and where they're worse for touch, sprains to ankles, wrists, um, in fact, if you use arnica in all sprains to bring down swelling, uh, it can also be used to prevent bruising and speeding up recovery. <clears throat> okay, so that's arnica. One of the very, very, very popular remedies around. Okay, so you can use a homeopathic dose of arnica for yourself if your family if you have noticed any of these symptoms being displayed by the particular person that you're treating the most important thing though if you're going to be using arnica is that the patient needs to have that sore bruised feeling All right it's a uh, that achy pain that just doesn't go away it's also very important that these pains need to feel worse if the particular part is being moved or if they're lying on that particular part that's sore and um, again remember if they say to you I'm okay just leave me alone when it's quite obvious that they're not Arnica <laughs> that's Arnica okay and you can get Arnica in that first aid kit that I am selling on my online store. All right, so the next medicine that we'd like to look at today is aconite. Now, aconite is uh, the, the uh, common name is monkshood. 
or possibly wolf's bane, B-A-N-E. And it's a plant that grows in pastures and wastelands in Europe, Russia and Central Asia. It contains a deadly poison, especially in the roots. And it has been used throughout history as a poison. Um, we use aconite as the first medicine that you need to consider in early stages of any acute illness that comes on suddenly. It must come on suddenly. So if uh, somebody has been out in a cold wind and they come back and they start getting sick, aconite. And it's important that the medicine is first given in the first 24 to 48 hours after the onset. The symptoms are sudden, violently acute, and often unbearable. Complaints come from fright, shock, getting chilled by a cold, dry weather. And that's something that's uh, very uh, a great symptom of aconite, where it is a, it's a, the complaints are from cold, dry wind. The pains are often unbearable. The person, can, the person can scream and is frantic from the intensity of the pain. The pains are often worse at night and by touch. But they're often better if they're outside in fresh air. Emotionally, the patient can be very anxious and fearful. They scream with pain. They have an agonizing fear of death, a fear of crowds. They may be restless, excited, nervous, feverish, impatient, and anxious. They're very thirsty, and they have a hot sweat that's covered over parts of the body. Often, we use aconite to treat the common cold, but it must be used at the very onset of the cold, from getting chilled by a cold, dry wind. It can be used to treat cough, in particular a barking, dry, hoarse, tickling cough. They're breathing fast. They're worse at night. Air passages are often irritated. Croup, it's the first medicine to think of. Earache, often the pain of an earache is unbearable. And again, remember, it's often from getting chilled from the exposure to cold, dry wind. Often there's a fever where the heat alternates with being chilly, especially at night. The pulse is fast. There's great anxiety. They feel hot inside and chilly outside. The cheeks can alternate from being hot and red to pale. One cheek and one, one cheek red while the other cheek is pale. And there could be a burning, unquenchable thirst. It can also be used to treat certain injuries like cuts and wounds that bleed freely, and shock. Shock from injuries, surgery, after childbirth, with extreme anxiety and fear. And it's often accompanied by shaking. So again, you can use aconite at home. But the, it should be the first medicine you need to think of after exposure to cold, dry wind. 
think of it if there's great fear or if there's great shock. Think of it if there is unbearable pain and the person is screaming. Mind you, if this is occurring, you need to go and see a doctor, okay? But think of this medicine, because it could be used in conjunction with any medication the doctor is using. And often it's worse at night and at touch, if you're touching the person. And often it's better in fresh air. So remember, it's a very sudden on onset. Okay, the next medicine is belladonna. Now, the common name for belladonna is deadly nightshade. It's a poisonous plant, particularly the berries of the plant. The medicine is used from the tincture of the whole plant and is generally used when the plant is beginning to flower. Uh, it's a great example of how homeopathy uses poisonous materials for some medicines that after the dilution of this particular substance and subsequent succussion of the substance, the medicine becomes devoid of all the poisonous elements, but yet its healing ability is enhanced. Belladonna is the first medicine to think of in the early stages of any inflammatory condition that is accompanied by redness, pain, swelling and heat. For example, colds, flu, sore throats, coughs, fevers, headaches, or earache. Again, the symptoms come on suddenly and violently. They are always associated with hot, red skin and a flushed face. Shining eyes and a very excited mental state. The complaints come on from exposure to cold drafts or getting the head wet, having a haircut or sunstroke. The pains are throbbing and they come and go suddenly. We've all experienced those throbbing headaches that go with the pulse. Boom, boom, boom. That's belladonna. You need belladonna in those headaches. The pain is worse for noise, light, motion, or jarring. The patient is often anxious, angry, confused, excitable, delirious, restless, and they can scream with the pain. They're very sensitive to light and noise. They're often over-emotional, critical, and complaining. They can't handle the least upset. Their eyes are shining and the pupils are dilated. They have a red face. They're always thirsty. The tongue is red like a strawberry. Belladonna can treat Coughs, in particular acute bronchitis with short, dry, tickling coughs. They're exhausting, they're dry, they're hard. It's a barking cough with sharp pains in the chest. Often they're very hoarse and it's worse at night and when they're deep breathing. Often they have an earache, especially in the right ear, with pain spreading down into the neck or face, with stitching, tearing pains and throbbing, with aching in the face and noises in the ear. They could have a fever, 
where the heat alternates with being chilly. They're burning, dry, radiant heat, which is often worse for being uncovered. They may have cold limbs. They may hallucinate or be delirious. They're thirstless. The headaches throb. They're congestive with bursting, pulsating, throbbing pain. They have a sudden onset and they're worse for cold or heat, bending down from the sun, from getting the head wet or from sun exposure. They have a sore throat with severe stitching pains and swollen glands. It's worse on the right side in swallowing liquids, though it has a strong desire to keep swallowing. They have swollen, fiery red tonsils, and the mouth is very dry and red. They could have sunstroke with fever and headaches. And often they can have painful teething with hot, red, swollen cheeks and red hot gums. So, when you're treating someone with that real uh, throbbing type pain, that bursting, pulsating, throbbing pain, sudden onset, especially on the right hand side, that real hot, red, swollen type symptoms. It's the stitching, tearing pains. Where there are, the pains can come and go suddenly. If they're worse in the noise, bright light, motion or jarring. Think of belladonna. That's belladonna. Okay, the last remedy for today is chamomilla. You may all know it better as chamomile. Okay, it's a a plant that grows in uncultivated fields among wheat and corn, especially in the sandy regions of Europe. Its tincture is made from the whole fresh plant when in full flower. Now we, uh, quite often, we've all actually undergone provings of chamomilla, where you might have drunk excessive chamomile tea. Symptoms could include irritability, insomnia, and that when you've actually stopped drinking the tea, the symptoms have gone away. Now, chamomilla is a great medicine for childhood disorders. Quite often, um, the child's emotional state um, is the key to deciding when and if to use chamomilla. Um, chamomilla is fantastic for children who are colicky or whiny or impossible to keep happy. They could be peevish, irritable, sensitive. The child asks for things and then they throw them away once they get them. And they always desire to be carried. It's just no satisfying the child. It could also be a great medicine for adults, where they could be angry or rude or snappish, impatient, and wanting relief from pain. Chamomilla is a fantastic remedy for a woman during labour. It can give instant relief. Often chamomilla is great for complaints that are caused from excessive coughing or teething. There are unbearable pains, 
very sensitive and where they want the relief now. Often their symptoms are worse in the evening or when drinking coffee or in fresh air, but they're better from being carried. Emotionally, they are peevish, whiny, impossible to keep happy, irritable, dissatisfied. And again, they can ask for one thing and then just throw it away once they get it. Their face is often red and hot on one side and pale and cool on the other. We can use it for diarrhoea in particular where the stool is green and hot and smelling like rotten eggs. Remember that one. The earache is stitching, tearing or aching. It's worse with the wind and it's worse from bending down. There could be insomnia with, sleep, with sleepiness from pain or anger or stimulants from too much chamomile tea or with restlessness. Uh, labour pains where there is severe, distressing, unbearable pain. Often the patient may say, I can't bear the pain or I just want to die. Teething, again, painful, unbearable teething pain. A child may cry out in, the, in her sleep with the pain. The cheeks are often hot and red or pale and cold. One red spot on one cheek. The stools are green. And the pain is worse from eating and drinking. And we all know children with chamomilla could be fantastic while they're teething there. So again, with the chamomilla, Remember, the pains are unbearable. They're very sensitive to the pain and they want the relief now. It's like, give it to me now. Think of the woman in labour. Give me the relief right now. The pains are often worse in the evening. In drinking coffee, in fresh air, and in the wind. And the pains are very, the pains are better, or the symptoms are better from being carried. Remember that peevish, whiny, and they're impossible to keep happy. That's chamomilla. Okay, now the next step is you need to look at your notes. And uh, <clears throat> there are some practice cases and some homework there. And what I'd like you to do before you go on to week two is to do all of those in your own time. Take your time and do them and just note the answers and uh, at the start of the next week we'll go through those answers to make sure that you have the right answers there and you've got a deep understanding of what we've spoken about today so if you need to get in contact with me on the screen now you can see my contact details there's my email address and my phone number, and my website. Feel free to give me a call if you'd like any assistance with any of these, any of this homework, or if you'd like to uh, organise to make an appointment to see me. I'm available four days a week and I can see you in person or on Skype or I could talk to you over the telephone. Preferably 
in person or on Skype is, is much better as I can get a much deeper understanding of where you're at and what you need help with. Again, as I've spoken before, on my website, in fact, here is the link here now, you can go to my store and you can buy a homeopathic first aid kit it has all the remedies that we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks, uh, plus a whole lot more, plus a really simple way of knowing how to pre uh, learning how to prescribe. Um, it's a really economical way for you to have these medicines in your home so that you can treat yourself or your family if ever they're needed. And quite often, you know, if you if you uh, need some help somebody's sick you can give me a call and say you know give me the symptoms and I can help you find the right medicine you've got the medicine right there on hand so it's a great thing to have and I definitely recommend that you consider getting one of those uh, the medicines will last a long time 10 years at least so $150 there is is nothing so really consider getting yourself one of those uh, homeopathic first aid kits and thanks for today and I look forward to catching up with you in the next week and in the next workshop. Thanks very much. I'll see you then. Bye.